Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Today, we want to welcome to the show, coming straight out of Queens, New York, streetball legend, NBA legend, and one mixtape royalty, the man who took the street ball game to the main streets and influenced a generation of point guards. None other than the point guard himself, our guy, Rayford, skip to my Lou, Austin. Welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you, man, on our first episode of Hoop Dreams Podcast. I'm Will Gates. That's my dog, Arthur A.G. In the building, Rafer, when was the first time you seen Hoop Dreams and who was you with? First time I saw Hoop Dreams, I actually did see with somebody. I just don't remember, you know, where and when, you know, actually time frame. I can't say it was uh, eye-catching, eye-opening. A lot of us, you know, I am grew up in New York City, so a lot of us could relate to. It made us feel as comfortable and as, uh, I want to say, uh, as close to you guys as possible without even knowing you guys, you know, you know, because sometimes forgetting, they don't understand how similar uh, the inner cities are. Mm-hmm. We all come from inner city, but different cities and states that we, we take for granted or don't know how similar. Right the situations that each one of us has gone through and right. in, in the, the chasing of the dream uh, is, is, is similar. Very similar in age, man. Um, you, New York City. And of course, with the movie, how, how did it impact you as a player? It impacted me as a, just as an ordinary you know, human being. But in fact, as a player, because you realize there are so many kids and all of us growing up that with the same, chasing the same dream, and we're all are good enough mm-hmm. at the time mm-hmm. to, to to pursue it. You know, uh, you know, throughout your travels in basketball, sometimes some people are good, some people are okay, some people just fall off. They don't play, they don't want to play anymore because it, you know, it, it is a tough and hard road. Even as youngsters, as young as we all were at the time, right? Uh, to to have to play against kids in Chicago, Detroit, LA all the different places, you realize it's so many of us playing and so many of us chasing the same dream and goals that you had to, it forces you to continue to continuously work on your game. Uh, right. And it impacts you, it impacts me as a human being because, you know, you realize your own personal home, home life and home situations, someone else is going mm-hmm. to say, and therefore, you know, if, if, if you got young guys like you guys that has to face those adversities and go through some things that, you know, we as well and other city states could, could fight through this as well. Right. Now, man, you know, playing basketball, man, we, we all be on the court. It's, you know, we, we grew up on a playground. Right. And so when you're on that playground, you know, guys say, you know, call you this name, that name, call you, you know, for, but you got to have one of the coldest nicknames of any baller that's, that, that come up. Skip to my loop. That, but just, just t- where did that come from? Who gave you that? Like, what they saw you skipping down the street with a basketball or something? Like, what? Man, Skip to My Luke came about, man. I was uh, 15 years old, to be honest with you. It was my second year playing in one of the most famous, famed Ruck, uh, Ruck or Park League in New York City. And, you know, one day I was, it was, it was, it was in the middle of a game. I thought it was in the middle of a game. It's like the other team was shooting a free throw, and I'm sitting there like, okay, what can I do next to get them off their feet? <laughs> and while I was shooting the free throw, I'm like, you know what? If I get a two on one, three on one fast break, I'm going to just put a little spin on the ball, but let the ball keep bouncing with me. And I'm just going to start skipping. And if the guy go for it, I'm just going to wrap it around and throw it to my teammate. And mm-hmm. for some odd, for some crazy reason, man, everything went true to form. And it just happened. And I just tossed it to my teammate. But the guy went for the ball. He thought I wasn't paying to the ball. I just threw it to my teammate. He caught it and dunked it. And the commentators on the microphone, their names uh, are you know, Duke Tango, Al Cash. They call him Tango uh-huh. Cash out there. And they were like, ladies, yeah. and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we got a new nickname for him. His name is Skip to my loop. This, that's the Skipster. And what people didn't know, my first nickname out there was the Energizer. Because the previous year, the previous year I was playing in Rucker, but I wasn't getting a lot of playing time because I was on the team with like some. At this time, these were some like legendary high school basketball players, the guys like mm-hmm. Jamal Faulkner. 
uh, Ben Davis, they uh, went to Arizona, uh, Khalid Reeves. They were all playing ahead of me. So I was like, man, I don't know if I'm against. When they, when they did put me in, <laughs> like, I was just heavy. I was fab, I would weave through the, weave through the defense, dishes to somebody laid in. And it was just like, mm-hmm. energize the bunny. He keeps going. And wow. it was a year later, man. Those guys are off in college and everywhere doing their thing. And I was, I was, I was rocking and rolling out there pretty much, you know, with just some other guys on my team. And I was the headline. That, that's how that name came about. Wow. I, I just got to ask a follow up to that question. So you got the name Skip to my loop. Man, how important, especially coming up in our era, is it to have? A nickname like you can't even get on the court <laughs> if you ain't got a nickname. I mean, how important was that? You know, the, the crazy part about it is it wasn't as important to have it as it was more important to gain a nickname. You know, because mm. so, there are people with nicknames that are called like if you're not good, they're gonna call you another nickname. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? You could be trash. You could be doo doo. If you name a negative nickname, that's what you're gonna be. So that I think the importance was. You gaining the nickname, and how was you, how are you gonna go about getting your nickname? You know, a nickname is not a nickname if it's self given. You know, what I mean, I can't give my name. I can't really. I can't go somewhere like, man, y'all call me Ray Ice. I'm like, I ain't gotta call you. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> if I came out there, somebody in that crowd was gonna give me a nickname, and there's gonna be a uh, new record with that by the the whole week leading up to the next week. Everybody, y'all know me. I can't wait to go see whatever nickname they gave me. And then the other side was the importance of the nickname is the importance of to uphold it. Because now everybody, right. every summer, everywhere you go, every winter, summer, spring, everywhere you go, they want to see why they call you that. And, you know, the fortunate part about me in New York City is I was able to show them every single time. And you was how old? You was how old at that time, Rafa? 15. I was 15. 15 with a nickname, 15. Skip to my Lou. 15. Two more years later, I was considered like a legend, you know, in New York City. Wow. You know, not only was it I doing my thing in Rucker Park, see, everybody that don't know I'm familiar with New York City, there's a lot of tournaments throughout the city at, yep. at, at, in, in one summer that a lot of us play in. You know what I mean? So there's times that I can have a, two or three games in a day in the in summertime. Day. It could be a Wednesday, and I might have a game in Harlem or a game in Brooklyn, and I got to finish one herb and go. I might have 25 and one. I can go all the way up to Harlem and the Rucker and, and score another. You know, you do your thing. And you and, it, and I'm playing at this time, at 15, I'm playing in pro ams. So 15, 16. Damn. I'm predominantly playing in pro am leagues, you know, uh, because most of, at that time wow. I, I was dominating my, my age group, you know. So I played 15 year old. I'm like, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm going to cut above those guys. Right. Wow. So, so when you was coming up, who who was like the 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 dudes on the court that you looked up to was like damn like I, I I'm gonna take some of his from some of his game I, I like them two guys like these are my two favorite guys like who who was some of them dudes well here's the interesting thing you know and and I, I know it's the same down in Chicago the interesting about New York City is we have tons of idols you know and I say that to say we have our NBA idols we have our college idols and we have our high school idols because we were young. Yeah. And then we have the local guys in the playground that we look up to, you know. So mm-hmm. for me, I just had everybody, you know. Um, wow. Worked my way down. So my NBA idol, because I, oh, I always wear number eleven. I always want to be Isaiah Thomas. So I wear number. I wore number eleven. If you notice, most of the videos and places you see me, I got number eleven on. Even mm-hmm. in the you know, before yeah. I was before I was energized and skits in my loop. They used to, they when I was like 13, 13, 12, 13, when, when the guys wanted to put me on their basketball team, they were like, no, we got to go find number 11. That, I was known as the number 11 in New York City. No, we got to go get number 11. Man. If you get number 11, you good. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's what's up. In college, you know, when I, I was young, so I was, we had guys like Kenny Smith, Kenny, I mean, uh, Kenny Smith, Pearl Washington, Rod Strickland, uh-huh. uh, Mark Jackson. Uh, we had all those guys to look up to, even guys like David Rivers, um, all these phenomenal guards throughout, throughout college that we were able to see on a, any given right. Saturday or Sunday, you know? So we we would look up to those guys because in our mind, we're like, you know what? I want to be on TV like those guys. In high right. school, at that same, that very same time, we had guys like Derek Phelps, uh, uh, Kenny Anderson, mm-hmm. uh, Adrian Autry, all right. these guys in, uh, uh, God bless the dead, this guy passed away from my neighbor, David Edwards, that went to Georgetown, ended up transferring to uh, Texas A&M. We had all these guys mm. up to, that we were like, yo, we want to, in high school, I want to have my high school career like them. 
then every summer in the playground, we had all these tough dudes that were just street ball players that were so phenomenal. Like, so before me, it was, we had a guy by the name of Future. He was like the skits of my little, when he was young, my age, he went out there in Ruck and Disney. Mm. You had guys like Master Rob, uh, one guy I like, they called him uh, the Dancing Doogee. You know, he mm-hmm. and because he stopped and dances that every move he like he just dancing and gliding on these dudes and just dancing every time he done because so we had all right. these guys to look up to as well so you know basketball for us growing up it was just embedded in us it was in our head in our minds visually uh 24 7. so Ray, i'm gonna just tell you two dudes that stick out from my head that i love from new york is uh ali mo and john strickland yeah, they were tough. Those, those were tough street ball guys. Yeah, tough, tough, tough. Like I mean, yeah. Guys, no matter what time you took Alamo and John, Big John Strickland, uh, uh, they they showed up and showed out. I mean, that's one thing. Yeah. I mean, they're gonna talk trash. They're gonna they gonna they and they got they had the game to back it up. And they still legendary in the street out there mm-hmm. right now. As both, you no know, rest in peace. They're gone, but we still think about. Yeah. Actually, uh, I don't know if it's today. I think today is John Strickland's birthday. Wow. Yeah, big street. Happy birthday, Big John. Absolutely. Rest in heaven. But I mean, let me just um, piggyback on that question, too, because, again, man, all them great names you just threw out there. But I remember when I was coming up, man, there was this guy in the neighborhood, man. His name was Sean. We called him Sheik because that <laughs> jumper was so smooth, man. Like, that was the one guy I had to overcome. Who was the guy in the neighborhood when you was coming up? You said, you know what? When I get this guy. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. You know, I don't think in the neighborhood because you know, again, New York is big. It's five boroughs, so I come from Queens. You had uh, guys in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Harlem, Staten Island. Um, right. But the only guy, you know, he was actually my, my peer. You know, and it was like whenever we see each other, I was like, man, I'm, I'm, I, I gotta continue to bring it, bring it to him, bring it to him okay. to show him I belong on the same court with him. Is 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 one guy was a Stephon Marbury. You know, it was Stephon Marbury and. I just, you know, because he was just a, a phenom, uh, and you know, he was everywhere you look, look, or uh, anybody spoke about uh, AAU tournament or high school ball, is they were talking about Stephon. So it was just, I knew whenever I had to face him, I had to come on my game, and that, that was, it was like I said, what's was overcome is that, you know, I had to make sure my game was on point when I faced, you know, somebody like that. The playground was the AAU circuit in a sense. I mean, night in and night out. I mean, you battling these guys. What was the mindset like when you got when you got to the Rucker Park or the other or or did y'all even travel to like other boroughs? Yeah. and play guys because like when we played, we went to this playground and that playground. Did, did you all? Did you do that? There's tournaments everywhere, so we don't we don't necessarily have to leave our borough to play pickup ball in the park against some other dude. Cause we're gonna face them someday during that week or weekend in the tournament, maybe in their in their borough or out on Queens or in Harlem or the Bronx. We're gonna face each other in some tournament somewhere. And the so mindset, no hiding. the mindset, it's like a two, it's like a you know, the mindset, two things. One is making sure we bring our game, right? And making sure we we bring our game, make sure we we stand, we 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 we, we remain tough mentally and if they bring if they play in a physical game. And then two, because every tournament is so packed and crowded, you go and come to my set, man, we can't let's not let the fans down, man. Let's 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 let's, let's give them what they came for. So it's like wow. it's two different mindsets because, you know, the crowd, even when you're coming up as kids, the, the park, like even when we played as nine and ten year olds, the game is packed mm-hmm. with people. And and you just going out there, man. It, it just you know it brings the best out of you at a young age. Let's talk a little bit about your high school days. So mm-hmm. you went to Cardoza. How how was that environment? Well, the environment. I went to Cardoza High School. I, so I come from uh, uh, you know the urban neighborhood, predominantly black neighborhood, uh, drug infested, impoverished. And I I decided I was going to go to school all the way in predominantly white Asian neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Curriculum was pretty strong for public school and everything. Um, the curriculum didn't bother me. The commute didn't bother me. I thought what 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 plagued me was hooking up with some of the wrong crowd in the school, which enabled which enabled me not to have the storybook high school career. Uh, I had a lot of uh, missing a lot of class truancy. You know, I did play my soft my freshman sophomore year. Uh, my freshman year, I was able to uh, play. My coach felt the need and the urge to uh, play the 
play the seniors, the seniors more. So I didn't play as, uh, a lot as I thought I should have because that's what they recruited me to come there for to play more. But just, but lo and behold, I, I was on varsity, and, and I was able to practice with those guys and, and see what it was going to be like when I when I take over the following year. I played my sophomore year. I got you know the team is mine. I got the ball. I averaged twenty five points per game. Um, mm. they snubbed me. They snubbed me for all city, um, and everything. But it was all right. But they, you know, everybody felt felt the wrath anyway. You know, when when they when I played, uh, and there was it was pretty much my junior and senior years when I I was missing you know so much school and just hanging out all hours of the night. And then when I did go to school, cutting class and. Uh, you know, hanging in the halls, playing cards at lunchtime, gam playing dice in the back staircase, just, you know, bringing my my environment from my neighborhood to my school. Um, mm-hmm. It just it just it just plagued me, man. It just stopped me from having this, you know, because I, I I played six games my junior year and I, my six game, I was 33 points a game in those six games. So you can imagine I played the whole year what I've been doing to New York City, uh, you know, um, high school basketball. So now, now what caught what cut short your junior year? I mean, it was the same thing. It just you know, missing a lot of school, not getting up early in the morning, but I'm staying out all hours of the night in New York City, uh, and you know, not making class. And you know, my junior year, <laughs> it was the same thing, repeated, repeated the same thing. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about too, uh, because we want this show to be more than just about the basketball aspect too. Like, what's what's the pressures of a high school athlete, yeah, especially you know you're going to a predominantly white school, uh, coming from the neighborhood, having to try to interconnect those two relationships like that. What were you feeling? The great thing for me was the school environment, the the curriculum didn't that's didn't it didn't phase me. That's not what phased me. <laughs> it was the problem of trying to take on a burden to feel like I have to do all, whatever I need to do whenever I want to do it to support myself, mm. feed myself, clothe myself, you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. that that was really the pressure and and, and the lure the lure of want, being around the fast life. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It, 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 mm-hmm. it, just to put it to say the least, it was it was really self-inflicted. It wasn't like someone mm. did something to me or because of my family and life situation, that stopped me. Nah, I, I was always able to get up in the morning. I didn't need no alarm clock. Like if I got to bed at a good hour, I didn't need the alarm clock. Right? But the law of right. wanting to be in, around the streets and wanting to dip and dive in the street life and all that, and you get your taste of some fast money and doing all that. You're like, man, you know, it's it's it was a part of growing up mature. But like, it's the same thing in Chicago, Detroit, D.C., all these places. As soon as you come out yeah. the door, all that's right there. Right. And so you, we, we spend all these years trying to not, you know, not mess with it, and then all it takes is that one or two times to jump out there, and then all of a sudden you, you hook to doing it, and you know, and it becomes it wow. part of you until you, until you just, you know, you, you find a way to let go. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine the things that you was going through high school now that you see with social media playing a role? in Skip's life in high school. What what do you think that would look like? Uh social media was when I was in high school, man, I probably have probably a hundred million followers, man. Because yeah. you know, for them to follow me in just one day, it would have been the most interesting day that they could ever imagine. Yeah. So, I mean, they would have saw everything in one day. They would have saw me interacting with the the crowd in my neighborhood. You know what I mean? They're gonna be like, man, yeah. how cool skinny kid he could and he's in the mix in them and he's in the mix with all them older dudes and you know, and <laughs> would have saw me playing ball. Cause through it all, through it all, no matter what, I found my way to the park and, and to mm-hmm. the So that's that was another crazy part about it. No matter what, I found my way to the park or to the gym to go right to, to do to hone my skills and keep my skills sharp. Uh they would have saw that, you know, it, it just it was it, it, it would have been crazy. I feel like it would have been crazy for me, though. So, look, check this out. I did some research on your high school, right? Uh-huh. So, these some dudes, people come from your high school. <laughs> Dwayne Coswell. Yeah. Daryl Hill. Yep. Showtime. Uh, Royale Ivy. Yeah. And 
Williams' favorite, Ron Jeremy. Out of all the people, and look, Dwayne Carlo was one of the first NBA guys. He he used to come back in business school. I'm like sending Ron Jeremy to come back. Right, right, right. And bring bring some of the ladies back with him. Oh, Ron J, man. I, I, I was. I'm like this, looking it up. Like, damn, that's just yeah. really the Ron Jeremy. I'm like, yeah. wow. So you know, you know, uh, I'm gonna just tell you one one famous dude that uh came from my came from my high school, and I and, and I and I got to and I got to do it how he did it in the movie. Taxi, Harlem Night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he graduated from Marshall High School. Okay. They got his picture up there on the wall of fame and everything. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's too crazy. Yeah. Skip the question now is um man, did was basketball it? Is that was that all that you played, or did you play other sports, or did you want to play other sports? Or was basketball like basketball's all my number one, baseball is my number two. I was not, I was a good baseball player. Actually, a lot of us. A lot of guys that I've met in all the neighborhoods we met, and we still friends to this day. We met them mm-hmm. little league, and we wanted to really? play. Okay. We played. We wanted to play little. We played little league, and even when the season was over, we played baseball in the park by ourselves. You know, neighbor versus neighbor. So we wanted to be a, a baseball player. You know, because I, we got the Mets and the Yankees in our backyard. Right. So we, you know, it was baseball was huge in New York City. Football's third. I was good in football. I just wasn't the guy that was going to go out there and, let, and take all them hits. But I, I, I excelled in any sport they threw at me. But basketball was king. Basketball was number one for me because yeah. it's the New York City game. It's, it's that's it. Mm-hmm. It's a kid being born right now. They probably put a basketball right in right in that baby's uh, crib. Well, whatever they put that baby in, it, it, right in, right in that. I house. want. I want. I want to ask you this about a fame program out there. What's up with the Gout Shows? The Gout is one of the number one. They're one of the number one top programs that you know that exists in New York City. You know, they, how did they even? How did they start in that little gym? No, they. It's not a little gym. It's a big gym. That's a huge. Really? Yeah, they got a big, nice gym, nice facility. I, you know, I don't know how they started because it was going on before me. But all the top players played with them. And then you have Riverside Church. That's the, the other one that you know they they can go neck and neck as far as all the players that play with them. Some play with play for both. Some play with Riverside, then went over to the Gaucho. Some play with the Gaucho, went over to Riverside. So I saw a picture on the internet that had Elton Brand, uh, Lamar Odom, and Ron Artest, and two more other dudes. Eric Eric, Eric Barkley. Yeah, that was that was that was that was ridiculous. That was that was illegal. Yeah, that was one team. And that, they were younger than younger than I would have been like, I got a, I got a sprained ankle today, coach. I just swollen up for no reason. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't, because you would have been. It, it, it would have been nothing because the, the problem with New York City is you'd have been playing against them since you were young anyway. So to see them in high right. school was nothing. Right. That's nuts. It's the same thing in Chicago, man. So y'all, y'all gonna see each other through the playground, through little regular tournaments, and then if y'all play in a national tournament, y'all gonna say y'all gonna, it's, y'all gonna be used to each other. We always hated when William Gates came over across the Division Street and tow us I up. I sure did. Man, I came keep, keep anytime, your, too. Keep your ass over there, hey, on, on, hey, on, over there Cabrini Green. He used to come over there and just dunk hey. all on us, bro. If the ball was bouncing on that side of the track, I was there. But let, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, Skip. I mean, you brought, up, you brought up the word athlete, and we hear that so much. Man, they like, man, this dude is athletic. That dude is athletic. And you just said, I was, I was an athlete, which, man, I 100% agree. What what is your definition of an athlete? And this is actually a uh, two part question. What's your definition of of an athlete? But also, when did you know, man, I can do this to on the next level? Shit. Uh, to me, I think a definition of an athlete is someone that it can can uh, can can move about in the sport with such grace, uh, has such agility. Has control over the, uh, him, his body. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you can see that you can put him in multiple positions in one game. He can play multiple sports. Uh, some people call some people call a relief pitcher an athlete because he can stand there and throw 
a 95 mile per hour fastball, but yet he's got a big stomach. We don't know if that that might be the only thing you do. So mm-hmm. I question if that's an athlete just because he could throw the ball. Some people say a golf right. guy's an athlete. Well, just because he can swing, hit the hit that, I don't know. That doesn't mean he can run. Right. I mean, so the word athlete has been taken far out of context, you know, and by a lot of sports. Like, right? you know, I watch a sport called curling. And they call them athletes, and I don't understand. <laughs> what, I don't know how they're considered athletes, but for myself, man, when I thought I could do it, um, I knew like when I, you know, my, my sophomore year in high school, you know, obviously, Damn. obviously, when I was young, everyone told me because they saw it, they saw it in me. But I always mm. believed in my game. It was always a dream of mine to make it. But you kind of get the feel when you're actually playing against top 100 players throughout the nation in my sophomore year because that, that, that some of my sophomore year we had traveled to mm-hmm. Virginia played against Blue Williams and they had Allen Iris and Tony Rutland the same team. I, I finished the game before 25. We lost but everybody in the gym was like, man, who is that kid? So that, you know, so in that whole summer, they, I, they took me everywhere. Lubbock, Texas, we played against Chauncey Billups, Antoine Walk, all these guys. We went to California, mm-hmm. played against Toby Bailey, Janani uh, McCoy, Ricky Price, all of them. And the whole summer, I'm just holding my own the whole so I'm doing my thing. I said, oh yeah. You know what? If that's who they who they're picking that that's gonna be in the NBA and it's gonna be then, you know, I knew I had I had a shot. It was just making sure off the court, you know, off the court was the part that played me so much. So, you know, once right. I went to junior college and got that in order, uh, the rest was history. So hold on, you just said you just slipped that in and said you watch curling. So who was your favorite curler? I don't even know the people, man. That's what I, 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 I lived in Toronto. I played the Toronto Raptors, man. They had that's curling was big up there, not, and they were saying these athletes. I'm like athlete. They would slide something across the house. <laughs> this is John Wagner. <laughs> yeah, right there, it, it, and yeah. look now they put it uh, in the pitch. What? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it, is. yeah it is. You know, I, I figured out the reason why they put it in the because some of these countries couldn't win these other sports. Right, they they right. put a sport in there. You know what? We can get a gold medal in that. Because remember, it's all about the medal count. <laughs> right. Now, Ray, for you being from New York, were, 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 do you feel that hip hop played a role in in the street in the street hoops and just and just the basketball culture in in New York? Period. Hip hop, hip hop, and basketball, street ball, and everything in New York City goes hand in hand. It's synonymous with each other. I mean, before you, when you walk in the park for your game. Right. Once the other game is over, as soon as that game is over, you, you they playing they playing hip hop music. You getting your mind ready. We walking in with that swagger. Uh, how we wore our, our clothes, uh, how we wore our uniform, mm-hmm. how we wore our uniforms, right. in, you know, in, uh, indication of how we would you know dress and dress. Matter from uh, hip hop. You know, watching mm-hmm. all the videos and everything. So <laughs> it, it, it's so synonymous cool. with New York City basketball. I mean, every part. Even when I was younger. So I was younger. And we was playing in the tournament. So my team, we from Quinn, we walk in the park playing against the Brooklyn squad, and they playing Rock Him. I came through the door, said it. So we like, we play. <laughs> Brooklyn music, while we playing the Brooklyn team, they, 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 they could have played Run DMC or LLC. Right. <laughs> After a while, on the layup line, we laid like, you know, after you lay the ball up, you go into the passing line, you walk like, right. off your head, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <that's- laughs> He said, I'm still going to bust y'all ass. It puts you in the mood like, oh, it's on in here today. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what's up. Remember, a lot of those music musicians, artists, rappers, they want to be ball players at one time. Mm-hmm. Ain't that what they always say? We want to be rappers, the ball players. <laughs> the rap side. Yep. A lot of guys that's in the street hustling up. They had dreams, aspiration to be ball players. Your top favorite New York rappers. You ain't got to go five, just top three. I go Nas. Jada Kiss. And people who knock me for this, but I'm going to go LL, man, because it's longevity. My dog. Because I mean, that's not to say Rakim and Biggie's not up there, but, you know, LL's longevity, man. LL did it for 30, 40 years. Man. That's a dope three. That's a dope three. I like Ten that. plus albums. Let me, let me ask you this, yeah. Skip. Let me ask you this, man. Um, of course, you know, in, in the movie, you, you see the impact that Arthur's mom, Sheila, had on him, my mother had on me. Man, I, I, how how supportive were your parents when you was coming up through the game? Well, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, kind of similar. Like Arthur, uh, you know, my mom uh, worked several jobs. Uh, mm-hmm. Father was always gone. Uh, my father's a drug addict, 
So he's always mm-hmm. on, you know what I'm saying? So, but the crazy part about it, my mom was working and doing so much. You know, to be honest with you, man, my, my parents very rarely saw me play when I was growing up. Mm. Wow. It, 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 it's mind block now, uh, I deviate a little bit, that I watch kids, I coach kids now, and all their parents are there. And these parents are acting crazy. I'm like, well, my mom would come out of the game. But if my mom came to the game, she would have to act crazy because she'd watch her son get 35 points. So I don't know why y'all guys act like that. But then I realized my parents didn't come to these games. But it was understood. See, when you, when you grow up the way we all grew up, reality hits you head on so fast that it was just understood. It was under my mother yeah. make these games. My father definitely ain't making it. I don't know. We don't even know where he at right now. So they're not making this game, you know. So wow. they trusted us with the coach. Whoever the coach came and picked us up, yo, you know, we used to wait outside. We look out the window of the building. Oh, yo, coach down there. All right, we run down. Yo. Every time the game, the coach runs back. The mama, our parents, my mother never asked, well, how did he do? They already knew how I did. They just want to know. Crazy. They wanted to know how was his behavior. Did he, did, 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 did my did son get along? Mm. Did my son back talk you? You know, those, mm. those are the only things that our parents were worried about because every other tournament, we, every, I mean, by the time I was 11 to 12, I had a, well over 100 trophies in the house. Right? Trophies everywhere. Hey, you know what? And it's funny you, it's funny you asked that question, Will, because there are kids now that can't even play or have a bad game if their parents are not there. Right. And, and because they're used to them coming, so if they if they parents don't show up to a game, like they, they these kids like is is like distraught. Yeah. But man, that, so all the kids out there listening to Rafa, hey, his mom worked two jobs trying to handle, make make ends meet. He already knew he had the self motivation to go out there and do it. If mom ain't here, she gonna hear about me having thirty five on these guys. The, 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 the part about it too is is you understand. Like I said, my reality hit you face on. We understand what's going on in our household. Yeah. So mm-hmm. basketball, yep. was our yep. basketball was my sanctuary. Like, I couldn't wait to go to a practice. Even if I knew practice about to be trash, I'm like, man, I'm going anyway because I'm about to get <laughs> the ball. I'm getting away from over here. So I ain't got mm-hmm. to think about why is it like this. With, with the kids today, do you see like the environment or the kids like how we grew up? Do you see... That and, and and this is like a two part question. Do you see the kids struggling like that today? And if so, do you see that hunger and that fight that that you had? Today is different. It's so totally different, man. I, you know, I, most of my yeah. kids, both their parents is coming to the game, which is a beautiful thing because we yeah. if we look back, we the one. That's how we the one. That's how it should be. Um, yeah. But a lot of these kids are being babied and pampered. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Every little thing bothers them. Every little thing bothers their parent. A kid go to the basket, the other kid tries to make a block, a play on the ball, and their kid fall, man. Oh, why you fat hit him like that? Like, that's basketball. <laughs> what <are> you, like, <laughs> it's too much, yeah. you know, it's yeah. not making them tougher. These kids aren't as tough. See, one thing about us, the, all the things we were going through in our household and our neighborhood, it just made us stronger and tougher. Stronger. And, and mentally ready and prepared for a lot of yes. things to come our way. You know what I'm saying? So. When when if if, if if someone stole the ball, we just sprinted back on D and tried to get it back. It's like we didn't stand there in power. I see kids that somebody stripped them, they stopped right there, like they about to start crying. Like, like what is the matter? He, he did what a defender wow. was supposed to do. I mean, mm-hmm. So yep. the, I think the pastors they have too much influence on the kids and, and too much to say when it comes to today's game. And it's just it's it's stunting the growth of a lot of these kids right now. Because they're actually listening to their parents who probably never played or never went anywhere in basketball, and they're not listening to mm-hmm. the coach who's went far. Some has went as far right. as I have, and some has went and played major college or went overseas, and they're not even listening to that guy who 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 has gone to where they're trying to get to, but they're listening to a parent who didn't go past middle school in basketball. How how are you navigating that? Because I mean, you skipped to my loop. How how are you navigating yeah. that? And, and 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 on on two levels. One, navigating it with the kids, but also, cause man, I've been out there on that AAU circuit. I coach these kids. You're right. Parents are off the chart now. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they yelling at referees. They yelling at you know other people's kids. Fights broke out. Like right. I've been, I, I was coaching games. Fights broke out on the scene. Yeah. <laughs> how, how are you navigating that? It's it's not easy. It's not because yep. their parents are the most stubborn of, of all. Like, you know, you you nowadays when we were young, you might get a stubborn kid. 
You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. a lot of us were stubborn because we might come out the game like, come on, I don't know why you take me. I'm, I'm killing out here. You know, we might be stubborn right. that front. But you got more stubborn parents that they don't want this. So I, I just, person like me, I just throw my resume at them. Right. There you go. If, if, if you want to be rich, do you go outside and listen to the person that has a cup in their hand? It's the same thing in sports. If you want to go far, do you listen to a parent that don't know that knows nothing about basketball? Or you listen to a guy, not to toot my own horn, because there's a, a ton, there's tons of us coaching. You know, you got Jeff right. McGee, let's coach this team. Well, I see mm-hmm. Matt Barnes coach this team. The list goes on. The list goes on. I heard Bobby Bobby Jackson from uh, Play for Sacramento. He got a team. Yeah, they all got teams. Bobby Jackson, the guard. Yeah. yeah so I'm just saying, if you're trying to go far in this game, you're not going to listen to somebody that, that that's where they went. They're trying to go right. where you're pushing your kid. The same level you're pushing your kid to get to, that person right there coaching your kid is going to. And you got a ner- you got the nerve to tell him what to do. Right, right, right. It's amazing. So your high school recruiting process of coming out of high school, going into college, how did that go? Like, who was looking at you? Who wasn't looking at you? Who, 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 where did you want it to go, but you didn't go? How did that recruiting process go? At, you know, my sophomore year, they was all coming at me. But after my mm. junior year and everything, they knew I would have to go to JUCO Junior College. So they all backed up. I mean, the top, you name the top schools was, 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 was right in me, mainly the East Coast, you know, because, you know, we, we always in front of the Big East um, mm-hmm. and everything. You guys in Chicago, y'all always in front of, like, the Big Ten. Y'all always in front of in, 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 in whatever conference DePaul is in. I know they bounced in so many different conferences. But y'all mainly right. in the Big Ten and, and whatever conference DePaul and, you know, and those Midwest schools are in. But we mainly in front of the Big East. So, you know, you had St. John's after me, Syracuse, all them schools. Did, did you love your junior college days? I still remember like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I love to see when Juco kids is posted. I'm like, man, listen, y'all can do this, man. You know, I know yeah. it's a tough grind, man. I went all the way to California yeah. to the junior college, man. And, and again, it, it was it was going to California. I did all my colleges in California. It saved my life. It saved my life. Wow. Far, to get far away to where I could just lock in on school and ball. No distraction. And it had to be in that order. Wow. Sometimes a lot of us, we put basketball first. But, you know, uh, I had to yep. understand that it had to be school and ball. And it had to be in that order. So throughout that throughout that junior college process, when you transitioned from high school, because at this point, you're skipped now. Yeah. yeah. Did you have to change your game? I was a student about the game. I knew how to run a team. I knew how to run the plays. I knew how to post pack. All this stuff was from watching every day. You know, they never had to teach me any of that stuff. My junior college, wow. my, my junior college coach could tell you. And when I first got to Ventura, he didn't know who I was because really? I just showed up on campus. So you wasn't recruited there? Nah, I was in New York City. It's August. This is summertime. All my peers, they going to colleges. Even my high school teammate, he going to Boston College, Dwayne. Where I'm like, damn. I ain't got nowhere. My AAU coach by the name of Gary Charles, he calls me and says, yo, I got a JUCO, man, you can go to in California. So I'm like, yo, hold up, man. I, I said, so, you know, let me tell my mother real quick. And I told her, I said, my, well, I need stuff to go. I need, I got to get clothes and all that. So I called Gary back. I said, yo, when, when do I got to go? He says, you got to go tomorrow. You can't play around. So I'm like, okay, wait a minute. So the first thing that came to my mind was the negative stuff. I got to get back in the streets. I got to get some paper. Mm. I can't go out here like this. I got to revamp my wardrobe. I'm going to be way out in Cali. But then I stopped myself. I said, nah, I ain't going to go out this door because I might jam myself up. I can get arrested. Anything can happen. I said, you know what? I just uh, took one bag. I showed up out there. When I got there, the coach was like, well, look, I already have the guys that I think is going to be on this team. But, you know, we're going to take a look at you. You, you, uh, We might redshirt you. So I'm all this is going in one ear out the other because I'm like when he right. see me play he about to he about to <laughs> so I, I got my I went to the count the guidance council everything the, the, the council's all there I got my schedule and all that boom so I, I and then I saw one of my things on my schedule was PE so he's like yeah that's the class he's he he he's the uh, PE teacher and he's like that's the time with all the players all my players we y'all just play and that's how y'all get in shape until. Conditioning period starts and the season starts and practice starts. It's all right. So the whole wow. standing there watching me, watching us play pickup. And I'm just killing these kids. I'm killing the little guard that he got. I'm just dragging these kids. And all you heard was, come here, you little mf Come here. I'm like, what's up, coach? Oh, you going to be on this team? I said, I know. 
I would just wait for you to realize. <laughs> <laughs> Dog, did, did any did, did, did any of them guys know you? Only one. Only one. One, uh, he was from Jersey. And then Hakeem Ward. Okay. He, he the only one. Yeah. And then um and then and then and then my teammate was from Chicago, may he rest in peace, uh Curtis Gaines, remember. Curtis I played against Curtis Gaines. Curtis. Big left hand. Curtis player. Big Curtis G C G. That's right. You no, know, so Big Curtis on my team. So I'm like, oh, okay. Damn. So Big Kurt was like, Big Kurt was come on to my yo, big. Like, oh, that's what I was about to tell y'all. I'm about to tell y'all. <laughs> I told y'all who about to come on the court. So you know, Kurt about that, that Chicago swag. Like, yeah, that swag, yeah. He so he he was excited too. He knew he knew he had to be ready for the passes. He like, boy, yes, he did. Ball. He had, he had good hands too. Oh bro. yeah, yeah, no, Kurt, Kurt, yeah. And then you couldn't stop him turning over his right shoulder for his left hand. He uh, could catch anything. Coach was just like, man, listen. We had a squad though. So Coach wow. was all in. He said, Look, man, I never had a team like this, man. All y'all gonna split time. So when you first think about it, man, I don't care, I can't split time in Juco. I gotta play, I gotta get up out of here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it all right. worked out. It worked out. We all played 20 minutes a game. 20 minutes a game. We ended up winning the championship. Mm. I got MVP of the state finals. My Hakeem Ward got uh MVP of the conference of our, of our, mm -hmm. of our conference, man. And it, you know, we lost one game, man. And so he goes. So he goes to uh, Syracuse. You go to Fresno. Who? Who? No, Hakeem. No, you think you think about Hakeem Ward? No, we all. A lot of us stayed out there. So my team and Hakeem Ward. Oh, okay. He ended up going to University of San Francisco. Oh, okay, uh, gotcha. Fresno State. Uh, a lot of us. A lot of them went with to to San Francisco University because our coach got a head coach. We we helped him get a head coaching job. Wow, just by doing that. They all went to the University of San Francisco, and Jerry Tarkane recruited me to go. So Jerry Tarkane recruited me, and I left Ventura Junior College, and I went up to Fresno City Junior College to finish out because Talk didn't want no one else to recruit me. He wanted me to stay right in his backyard. So that summer, I went to New York. Talk came and got me uh, at Rucker Park. I was like, yo, you're, I need you. To, uh, I want, I'm want. i recruiting you. I'm getting the head coach. I got the head coach job at Fresno State. You know, you do you do in one more year at Fresno City, you come over to me and be my our starting point guard. It's crazy because after my first year, I had big trash bags and mail. And then after my mm -hmm. second year, even though them schools kind of had an idea that I was going to Fresno State, I had all kind of mail. I, was, I ended up becoming a Juco All American. I had tons of mail. They were like, man, this that they knew they kind of knew that I was going to Fresno. Man, State. I I would have been so geek if Tart came and got me like you said. He man, I would have been like. Like I seen when I saw Isaiah Thomas for the first time, like what? Yeah, like you finna, I'm, I'm gonna be your PG. Oh yeah, I'm coming. What was that transition like? Because I mean, I think about man. I mean, you're going from one coast to another coast, and of course, the mentality was different. Like it, it's it's interesting because man, when I when I'm I'm hearing your story, and man, when I was doing research on you, a lot of your story lines up, lines up a lot like how Arthur's story lined up. You know, man, he went down the mineral area. You know, just needed to get away, get out. How, how, yeah. how was that transition? Because also, too, a lot of guys like to come back home. I did that one time when I was in high school. They sent me to Longburg Prep in uh, Longburg, North Carolina, man. I'm a city kid. I'm One time I asked my mother to Western Union some money. I, I, I asked people where the Western Union is, like, right down the road. And I'm, I, they still had dirt roads, <laughs> chicken, <laughs> a chicken, ran across, a chicken ran across my feet. So I went to the you know, Western Union inside the bus station. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. I said, I can't. Damn. I said, I can't be down here, man. I can't do this. No, um, I'm sitting here. So I got my money, went back to the dorm, packed my bag, jetted all the way back to the bus station, bought me a bus ticket, went home. I showed I'm like, what the hell are you doing here? Like, mom, I'm a city kid. I can't. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That was the only time I ever was able I went home. That's the only time I didn't stick it out. Anywhere else I went. Anywhere else I went, it was easy for me to stick it out. It was a no-brainer. And uh it was nothing for me to stick it out and just, you know, and just fight through it. But whenever when I went to college, it was I knew what I was going there for. And my whole mindset was to to make it work. Uh don't make it harder and don't make it harder on myself. Uh I already made it hard on myself by not doing what I needed to do in high school. So I didn't don't make it hard on myself out here. And and, and the basketball's gonna take care of itself, man. It was no question in my mind about the basketball. It was to make mm. sure, you know, I had this, un, I don't know, a knack or call it uncanny ability that I always found the hood and no matter where I went. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, 
that was who I was, man. So it's like it's, if they sent me to, <laughs> they sent me to, like, if I went to DePaul or something, the scariest part everybody in New York City would be like, please keep him away from the dice game and keep him away from parties in the, the club. streets. You know what I'm saying? So that was really my biggest thing. You know, is to stay away yeah. from all that stuff. So, you know, because that's what we grew up around. That's what I know. You, you know said I mean? you so, said something important right there. You said, "I knew what I was going there for." What mm-hmm. were you going there for? School and ball. School and ball. Get me an education. In that order. Give me an education. And this was a time, you know, so when you're there, you start to realize, forget the basketball part because everyone has told you how good you were going. Everybody's talking to you. I mean, you're going to be in the NBA, you know, they not knowing how hard it is to make it. And, uh, but when I got to my junior college, when I got to my first junior college, I'm like, you know what? Now I got a chance to get a free degree. <laughs> now, I wasn't thinking about none of that before. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking about ball, ball, right. ball. I got the ball. I'm trying to go to the pros. This is what I'm trying to do. I ain't nothing else. I'm not trying to be an engineer. Right. I'm not trying to be a lawyer, doctor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You say, I'm on, I got the Ben Simmons mind, mindset, right. baby. I'm right. coming here for one thing, you and I'm it. leaving. Yeah, exactly. But then I was there. I'm like, so I didn't major in, like, every all the average major in communication and stuff. Like, my major was psychology. Yeah. So I knew. I said, I'm going I'm to I'm major somewhere. I know I had to push myself. Man, lo and behold, man, my my oldest daughter, I had her in Fresno. She ended up going to Columbia University. Uh, mm-hmm. She ended up major in psychology as well. You know what I mean? Oh. So, you know, I like, so like, that was I, my... like I was telling you, like, the school part was not, a, it was never an issue with me in school. Right. School, school work, never an issue, man. It was just, was I going to get to the school? <laughs> going to get to the school. That's what it was. Was, was I going to complete this? Was I going to complete this assignment? Yeah. I mean, oh, no, I, I the assignment wasn't going to be nothing. I, for some reason, my mind worked like that, man. I, I could, like, I could do the work. I can comprehend the work. So I think you are only one, or maybe I think two, street ball guys that start. I mean, you on the cover of Slam magazine, brother, with a Fresno uniform on, doing one of your famous between your legs. Like, do you have that cover at your house? Yeah, my mom still had that cover. My mom still had really? that for me, uh, put away. When when you saw that, what what what, what did you say? Like, you was on the cover of Slam, bro. It was shocking because I, I it didn't come out that I was gonna be on the uh, cover. It was they, they were gonna do a nice three page spread, but mm-hmm. a guy by the name of Ronnie Zidell, he was working with Slam. He's the one that convinced him to be on the cover. The people at Slam was like, we can't put that on the cover, man, because no one really knows him like that. He's not an NBA guy. He's, he's not a, a, a college All American man. So. They they were like we can't put that on the cover. It's gonna take our rays out, and it took and that that magazine took off just like when everybody else was on. Dude, I got a crate. I got two crates full of Slam magazines, and and I know I have I know I have that in there. Like I slave I save magazines from the nineties. Right, right. You know they don't they, they, you can't even you can't even really get a Slam no more. No, nah, not really. I mean, well, you know, you, people ain't really buying the magazine. But you still buy get them on. You still they out. You still see them online. You still but yeah. You, I, you, I still, actually you know, I still get Slam magazines that come to my house. I still get them. Oh, they do. Yeah, yeah, you still get them. Is Russ still over there? Who? Russ Benson. Uh, Russ. I'm not sure about that. I know I still get magazines because my son's still putting the the inserts on his walls to this very day. Right. Let me let me ask you this though, because Slam magazine cover. You at Fresno? What's the relationship? What was that like with you and Tark? Tark was good. Um, Tark wanted me to play. You know, as long as I can get after defensive, because Tark is more defensive minded than he is offensive coach. You know, okay. as long as we was getting after defensively, and he just let up the offense. He man, he 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 wanted to give me the ball and just push and run the team. It was the assistant coaches that they had this thing where they just wanted me to be this uh, point guard that just set everybody up and that's it. They'll maybe take three or four shots, but you know. So I had a little riff and back and forth with the sister coach because that's how that's what they thought I should be doing. But I'm trying to tell them I don't think he could. I don't think he wanted me to come here because to do that. You know, what I'm saying I, I'm sure he recruited me because what he saw. You know, but I also yeah. had so much firepower in me, in which I thought. You know, I had Chris yeah. Hamilton, Ter- Ter- Terrence Robeson. I had all these guys of like Andre Jones, Tremaine Folks, Mel- I, I, Melvin I, Eli there, Melvin Eli, but Melvin was sitting out. Mel, the, okay. all the Chicago, all the Chicago kids were sitting out. You know, you know, you know, yeah, that's that CPS, man. 
All the inner city kids. They, 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 remember back then, they still had Prop 48. So yeah, Prop 48. Randy Holcomb and uh, my guy, Nick Irvin, all sitting out. All sitting out. Nick, Nick. Yeah, they was all sitting out, man. So, like, um, I was like, damn, all the Chicago kids sitting out. And I said, and I'm like, next year going to be crazy in here. You know. Yeah, but, right. You know, Nuts. But, you know, I, had, I was like 11 points, 7. I, led, I, I think I led on second in the conference assists. You know, but I had so much firepower. We had, like, maybe seven, six guys having a double figure on our team. You know, we, we – we squandered that year, man. That's the only year of basketball in my life I said regret. I regret not putting more points on the board and, and, and taking over the team. Um, but, but coach was still good with me. Coach was all right with me, man. Coach, you know, coach let me know it, it, it. You know, it was tough to have to play with so much firepower and not let my game out. He, he, coach understood. He'd been around a long time. What was that relationship? I mean, were you all still up into his passing? Did y'all stay in contact? You and Tark? Not really. A lot of uh, not me and Coach. Not really. Um, I actually Coach came to visit in Houston when I played in Houston. Coach came to visit, man. And Coach let you know how proud he is. Uh, mm-hmm. but a lot of his play, a lot of us, his play. We all, we all cool, man. Like we all respect. We all know what it's like playing for such a legendary guy. Who he's the one coach that cares about the, the players, man. And I'm talking about from a standpoint like if you get in trouble, the coach is not one of the guys that's going to just throw you to the wolves. He's not mm-hmm. going to just say, "Well, get." You know, most universities, yeah. you get a speeding ticket, they trying to get getting ready. They want to get ready. You know, they want right. to one guy. They'll stick his yeah. out of line, his job on the line to help a kid get his life in order. Yeah, he showed that. He showed that in the movie uh, with uh, Sweet Pea. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. show he, 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 ran, man, he, he stuck ran, behind him as long he, as he could. He went right to court with him. Yeah. None of your legendary coach right now would ever do that. No, no. no right, no, no, because no, they ain't, no, they ain't finna mess that up. You're not they, seeing these guys go to court. They're not doing it. Stand behind the very it. same guy that just won you 60 games. Right. He took you to the final. So check this, Ray. For before we jump into the draft and and and, and all of that, give us some uh, the what we don't know how to end one whole thing with with your footwear and that whole thing, New York. Hold, well, with. hold up before you go there, Ag, because I wanted to okay. ask um, Ray for about this the Fresno situation. With the young lady, I just got to ask that because, you know, um, we also trying to we want we want, you know, folks that's listening, particularly man, young high school athletes, college athletes, things that they need to be aware of that can get themselves in trouble or or, or things that they need oh, to absolutely. to recognize. You know, like I don't know if there's signals or not, but that right. that Fresno State situation with the young lady. Well, it was my girlfriend at the time I was dating then we were breaking up. And I went home for the summer. I came back. I wanted to retrieve all my stuff, my belongings. I, they, would, they would put me in a different house anyway. I was I was going to be in a apartment with my teammate. And mm-hmm. she was mad to my, I used, you know, to my, she heard I was messing with this girl, that girl, you know. So I was like, look, we're going to break up. Let me get all my accolades. So I had all my plaques, my junior college plaques and all this stuff. I'm like, let me get all that stuff. She didn't want to give it to me. So mm. I just left the house. I slammed the door at the house. Lo and behold, she told the people. I did X, Y, and Z to her, which everyone knew that wasn't the case. Yeah. It wasn't the case. That that wasn't who I was. So it got out that they charged me with domestic violence without even right. getting the full story on both sides. Yeah, and right. also to the government too, when you're in the small college towns, you, you yep. I am big news. You know? enough, <laughs> not enough else going out there. So the star point of President State now is, you know, just on the cover of Slam, every, you know what I mean? Uh, picture all over yeah. the town. Jess was the number one guy because at the junior car, now he's about to be the, you know, that's big news. So they, the, what happened was too, the court system out there was trying to railroad me and mm-hmm. the girl was trying to railroad me like, I shouldn't play. Like, he shouldn't play. I'm like, what? Wow, let's get him. Talk is like, that's, he's like, that's not happening. He, he can, we gonna go, send, get him a lawyer and go to court. So, you know, I was, I played my whole year though. I mean, I was able to get, I was able to get, come out of that, uh, the year on the stage, but I had missed the court date some court dates in between there because of school traveling and stuff, like, traveling. which they knew, mm-hmm. which they right. knew I was going to miss. But because it's that it's a small town, it had to make it big news. I mean, I, after the season, I ended up having to go to, uh, to go back to court and mm-hmm. I just got drafted to the Bucks. And so I went back to Fresno to handle this situation. And they were like, no, we, we want him to do 30 days in jail. Wow. <laughs> right before I went to the bus, so the Bucks already knew. A lot of teams knew. 
Right. So that's They've done their research already. That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the reason why I slipped a little bit. In the, I slipped in the second the draft is that they would ask me about that friend's situation. I said, well, I got to go back and handle that right mm-hmm. after those workouts and draft. So, but the Bucks found out. They knew they said, what do you feel? Asked me what I feel about that. I said, I'm not worried about doing my 30 days or whatever. I said, I'm hoping that they can give me uh, – Something else with it, you know, probation, whatever. Right. But they, they's like, you know, again, small town. No, we want to do thirty. I did my thirty days. Right. I came out. The Bucks still wanted me. There was a lockout. Yeah, I got drafted. I ended up going to the Idaho Stampede, the CBA team, mm-hmm. and then that summer, out. Uh, so February, that they let the NBA come back, but they were like, well, you don't want to waste your rookie year on a half a season. So we'll catch you coming back when the season's over. Um, four. Yeah, and you play summer league, and then you come back to train again. Mm. It was a blessing in disguise, man, because most people like like that's an SMA, They will never get a second chance like that, and they will never have no NBA team like the Bucks. Shout out to the Bucks, man, for standing by me and just understand understand the situation that they did. They do. Yeah. They said, "No, nah, okay." They understood. Yeah. Big up to the Bucks. So, so I I know it's hard to look out for that, but what 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 do you tell up and coming athletes, especially athletes, man, in, in your situation? Who, who are elite athletes? What? How do you? How do you? Like like your your seventeen U squads. Like how do you help them navigate relationships like that? It, the relationship part is hard, you know, because you don't really know who the the people the person is. Un, you know what I mean? Um, it's hard to decipher which one is there for you for you who you are, not for the basketball. You know, mm-hmm. What's what's what lies down the road? So you know that that's, that's always going to be a tough one, but it's a lot of other stuff that I can tell them about as far as staying clear of, you know, it, that's the one thing I can say about growing up in the environment that we grew up in, didn't have a father that is on drugs, that you could do, I was around that, so that you, I could tell them staying clear of that. Sure. If you don't want mm-hmm. to talk with that, alcohol, uh, gambling, this, that, and the third, you could always tell them about those things. Yeah. Well, who, who who was helping you navigate that during that time? Was it was it your parents? Was it? I had, no, not my parents. It was just... Uh, uh, It'll be hard for your parents to tell you about that when they <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you looking at their side. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean. But not, I had people helping me out, man. I had a lot of uh, a couple of a coach that he passed away back now, but Mike Bell he helped me out. My other guy that was like an uncle to me, uh, Mike Ellis, he helped me out with that stuff, man. So, um, but sometimes it happens, man. Sometimes it it just comes about, man. It's, and you know. Uh, Sometimes it's not self-inflicted. Sometimes it's, you know, yeah. there are people that, that are out here that, that that are gunning for you for your downfall. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. So now, the and one sneakers, the whole how that become. They just, and one took a liking to me. That kind of became like under undercut. It was a situation where they got footage of, of from some people that were filming up, like me at one park or around the playgrounds in New York City. And they decided to roll out a tape. You know, unbeknownst to me, man, they decided to roll out a tape, man. And it took off like wildfire. I had no idea. I had no idea of, of, of the origin, you know. I think this tape rolled, the tape might have rolled out. I can't believe it. I don't know if I'm right, but it rolled out before I was ever in the NBA. So it rolled out. I mean, I should apologize. My mother, my mother couldn't really capitalize off it because they didn't, they didn't approach her, mm. tell her, you know. But I couldn't capitalize because I was an amateur, and on that, right. it made me a star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just added more fame to your name already. It, it, it added more. Uh, it added a whole other story to the to the. The and one added the boy with the sprinkle. Yeah, you know, it took off like Wi-Fi. The whole and one thing. So while I was in the NBA. Uh, and every summer they would go out this mixtape tour, and then that's mm-hmm. how I reconnected with them. It's like they thought it'd be dope if I jump on the tour mm-hmm. with the rest of the guys. So I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I- I'll do that." And uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, but I'm I'm quite sure by now you in business, Ray for mode now, right? Yeah, yeah. So no, so they came about too is that they wanted me to wear their shoe in the league too. So not only was really? paying they shoe and getting paid the way they shoot in the league, that also was paying me to jump on tour. They were gonna pay me another salary to jump on tour in the summertime with them. Mm-hmm. That was dope. Um, actually, our guy, you know, just to connect, let's sort of, you know, the views and connect is that the same guy that helped you guys end up becoming my agent my first couple of years was Keith Kreider. Uh, mm-hmm. Keith Kreider 
was able to broker the deal with me to get back with one during the season and then get me a whole separate deal to do the AM1 mixtape tour. So it was kind of cool. I was, like, I was getting paid to be around from them, <laughs> you know, uh, on two different on two different entity, entities. That's crazy. So, so the guys, so the, so they they you at the Rucker Park playing. Somebody's out there filming, unbeknownst right. to you, and one get hold of the tape, and they just not to that ten. They approached them, or they had they made the whoever was filming probably sold them the footage. Not because they didn't, mm -hmm. they just giving stuff up. They right. they, they sold them the footage, and one took it to a whole new level with how they. I you know, remember you had to go in the store, mm -hmm. buy and yep. t shirt and one show or something, and they'll, you get the tape. You, you get the tape, yeah. And then you know how they was doing it in a hood. All they did was one person. Somebody duplicated. Now they making yep. $20. And I got the and one tape. You ain't got to go in the store and buy nothing. You can buy the 20 So the hood, everybody's making money, but skits my look. <laughs> so were you <laughs> like the first official and one guy? Like and one sneaker guy? I, I could, I that could had know. a deal. No. No, but they I think they did with Marbury and remember they got they got drafted in ninety six. I was drafted in ninety eight. So okay, Marbury okay. and them were signed with Animal and those guys, uh, a couple other guys, they did their they did their contract before me. Okay. So the skip to my loose shoe, it comes out actually man, it's funny, I had a pair. <laughs> I had a pair of skip to my loose shoes, man. How how did that feel? I mean, like, you got you got your own kick. It was legendary, man. It was it was the dream come true. You know, we we don't war like that. I remember growing up wearing all kind of wearing. Uh, uh, I want. I, I begged my mother to get me the weapons, the Converse, because I say <laughs> the match when the weapon made my. Like, I think I, I think I kicked the hole in the wall. I mean, if you don't get me these weapons, just, <laughs> I think she was ready to send to a group home when I did that. Man. <laughs> right. No, it's like 87, 88, 87. Yeah, I'm like, not. If you don't get me these weapons, I gotta put these weapons. Like I need these shoes. Yeah. So wow. Yeah, I remember. I remember. When the Ewings, when we, we drafted Patrick Ewing in New York City, I, remember, I got the Ewings. Then when we was playing, we, we had a summer tournament in New York City. Xavier McDaniel, they was giving away them nasty. Xavier McDaniel just had the X on the side. The, the X on the side, that ugly shoe. Oh my God! We we was wearing we was wearing the nasty uh, the Kimmy Matumbos. You know, yep. they was giving away a lot of a lot of they was giving away the, the, the Matumbos. It, it was a three on three blacktop tournament. They gave those away. So when they was when Ann was like, "Let me get your own shoe," I'm like, "Please do." <laughs> mm, mm. You know, it, it was cool, man. Now, Rafa, from the from when you would go on a tour because your agent had hooked them, hooked the, hooked the, both of them deals up for you. Was any of the guys on the tour jealous of you? Like, man, he made it, and we didn't, and he, we know he getting no, more than I, us. And to be honest, when I first got on tour, when I first got to it, they 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 didn't show that side, uh, that. right? But when I come back another summer, and summer later, you come can see that. And, and yeah. me, it was like that's crazy. Cause I don't know why. I said a lot of them was from New York. I'm like, no, we come from the same. We come from the same cloth. So, you know, we right. all grew up playing playing ball with and against each other in different summer leagues and stuff. Some of us all played against each other in Rucker Park. So it was like right. I don't know why they act like that. You know, it's you know, uh, the, but the most mind boggling part was they never even asked. You know, man, how can I? What what do I need to do to to get there? You know, so by my third year in the league, they they started. The, it was called the D League. So by this time, by the third tour, yep. they started the D League, and they and I even went down to the D for like four or five games like that. Before that, I went right back where I belong. They uh -huh. didn't even ask me, yo, what do I need to do, yo, right? So I hooked I hooked one of my guys up, and he didn't even ask me. I just hooked him up. His name was uh, Ao. Ao was on the Am one tour with me, and name's Aaron Owen. I hooked him up. Mm -hmm. and I mean, he went down there. My coach at the time was a guy that used to play the Bulls and the uh, Celtics, named uh, Sam Vincent. Yep. So Sam Vincent, mm -hmm. Sam Vincent was my coach, and Sam, I just, I just blew Sam away with the way I played. He said, "Man, this guy's bad," and he told me after mm. my first game, he said, "You ain't gonna be down here long." I said, "No, nah, I just need to get in a little bit more shape. I'll be out of here." So I only played like four mm. games. I was gone. So he was like, "Damn, I'm gonna wow. got no point guard." I said, "Sam, I got somebody that can play point." Because I knew, I knew Ao wasn't no just an ordinary and one streetball dude like streetball guy. Right? He could really play. Everybody only saw him in the AM one. That's totally different than what we call street ball in New York City, Chicago, DC. Yeah. We yep. call street ball because the tournament is in the park. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know that. It's called street ball where I'm from because all of our basketball tournaments is in the park, in the playground, in the streets. So that's what we used to call street ball. But the, the AM one tour was named 
the street ball on ESPN. So everybody's like, oh, that's street ball. Like, nah, that's not what the style we call. I'm actually glad you brought that up because even when we yeah. was coming up, we we didn't even say street ball. We was, man, you was either going yeah. to the court or you was at the playground. Oh, you was at the yeah, playground. You know, the name doesn't change. <laughs> but but my, my question for you is, you get the sneaker, you, you're doing the tour, which, by the way, I did see you when, you, when y'all used to come to Chicago because y'all used to play at UIC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Talk about the founders of And One because that that whole situation changed over. I mean, yeah. How, how did that affect you? Because that happened during during your time. Yeah, but the founder was cool. I mean, they they business minded. They, they founders do what they supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you start a business from, from from nothing, and all of a sudden, the business is worth hundreds of million dollars. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's no. I don't. I, I have no animosity towards or no no hard feeling towards it, man. I mean, they always showed us love, man. It's not. It, it, I mean, people forget a lot of those guys was making just for the summer. Some of these guys making a hundred, hundred twenty-five thousand dollars on tour. Wow! Just from June to August. That's crazy. A lot of people don't understand. You can't. People don't understand. Don't get it twisted as if and one player, those guys wasn't getting a nice piece of money just for three months. right. Remember, just for three months. Right. And you're not that was one hundred twenty thousand for twelve months for three months of action. They would get. Ah, that's a lot of money. That's like. <laughs> That's after forty thousand a month. You got five hundred. You got five hundred Fortune five hundred companies coming on board sponsoring this tour, bro. Yeah, we had Mountain Dew, Red. We, we was we was the number one show in the summertime running on ESPN. I mean, it was look. You know, it's it's all of us that did it. But I was in the NBA. But most of the guys, it's, it's you know, it's our fault that we didn't capitalize off capitalize off of the brand. Mm-hmm. Yep. Company was good. They were good guys. They took care. They flew us all across the world, different countries. Guys even went to Dubai. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so they forget. They, we live like rock stars, man. We, we pulled up to Chicago, I mean, people were ready to get on the tour bus. Everybody, we, everywhere we went, man. We've been to Birmingham, Alabama, and all these people, like, I'm talking about 10,000 people loved us in the park. In the park, in the, in the park that they go to every day just to sit out there and do nothing and picnic or whatever. You know? That's how I knew. That's how I knew the two was the tour was getting money because remember that when they first started off, they was going to the parks doing it. Yeah, they went to the arena. Yeah, they start going into the arena. Yeah, so I'm like, you selling out arenas. Man. Yeah, you were. But, but, but what do you think went wrong? Because because at one point it really seemed like okay, there was Nike, Adidas, and then A and One was like next. You know, it was like and, yeah. you know you you and Reebok were kind of fighting. For that third spot, everybody played a major role in its demise. You know, and sometimes we, everybody got complacent. Everybody was enjoying the ride and the love and the money mm-hmm. uh, that we forgot about going about our business and doing it. Keep continue to do the things the right way to to keep the train rolling. You know, we 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 wow. even some of the guy people that work for the company they stopped. When we got to certain city, we were supposed to do our in stores and stuff. They stopped coming promotional. to promotional promotional stuff. They stopped making sure we get there on time. They stopped. They, everyone was just complacent, you know, thought everything was going to last forever. Even some of us mm. as the players, man, we we took it for granted, man, complaining about a lot of things and showing mm-hmm. bad attitudes and always, you know, always yeah. getting into something and fights between each other and arguments. So, you know, yeah. that's when it got to the point where the people were like, well, you know what? We made out enough money as a company off you guys, and they sell a thing for four, five hundred million dollars. It's a wrap. I mean, that that's something that you know no other ballers can say, except who was on that tour and who got on the bus and who got off the bus. But the but the main core of you guys, AO, half man, half amazing, like y'all was like y'all had a brotherhood. Yeah, Correct? a lot of us. Remember, a lot of us. First of all, a lot of those guys we you pick up along the way, and then a lot of us we've been around each other. Before that, so yeah, I like that man, myself, uh, uh, main event, Shane, Alamo, mm-hmm. LA, a lot of us been been around each other for so long. Then we developed mm-hmm. really relationship with guys that we picked up. Like we, we the sad part about like four or four of them are gone. Like we lost our yep. we lost our brother Chicago Flash. Flash was yep. we picked up Flash from Chicago. He was big. Flash had a big imprint on all of us, man. Flash. He wasn't your ordinary Chicago kid, man. Flash was my yep. man. Flash was just a cool guy. He spoke like he's yep. he singing R&B. 
I thought that was one of the things that was special about what Ann One was doing. You know, they gave guys an opportunity. If a cat was killing in the city, y'all would give them an opportunity to get on tour with y'all. I thought that was unique. And, they got on. and a lot of us, we welcome everyone with open arms because, it, yo, let's be frank, man. We weren't playing no real strenuous basketball. Man. No, no. Right, right, right. That's a modern day globe trials. Modern day globe trials. And out there having fun it's with escalated it. at another level. We had to come to Detroit, Chicago, and really play against. The creme de la creme of Chicago. Man, things would be totally different, man. First of all, wow. they ain't letting you hit him in the head with no basketball. Somebody been laid out on that court. That's right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you're right. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, so to me, I, I think a lot of those guys also took that for granted. It's like they, a lot of us felt we were on TV that we were you know, the best bas- some of the best basketball players in the world. Like, hey, not so fast. Not to say that we don't have game. It's just chill out. Yeah. Do, really you, do you thing. think they also thought that it would never end? I don't know if I can say they thought it would never end. It was just they didn't think the ending was coming that fast. Mm. I don't know. Okay. It's not that they didn't think it was coming. They, they didn't think the ending was right around the corner. Well, we want to we want to jump into your NBA career. You get you get drafted yeah, by because, the Bucks. Yeah. Because of the lockout, which by the way, I did see you at the Chicago camp. I saw you. I saw you down there. At the pre-draft. Yeah, I saw you at the pre-draft camp. Yeah, I was. Just, I was. Destroying, I was destroying them cats. Yeah, you was killing them. You, you, you was killing them. Because, because back then they used to, because you know we were the hoop dreams guys from Chicago, so they used to give me the little free pass. I used to walk on up in there, and um, and Lovely. what 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 was amazing was man, I mean there was a lot of guards that came out when you got drafted. A lot of top players in there. On my team, I had Teron Lou. Uh, Anthony Carter was in there. He went undrafted, but ended up playing with the Heat. He got picked up by the Heat and all that. It was so many dudes in there. That's when a lot of – that was when people weren't turning down. It's like very – only like the top 12 or 13 picks was turning that turning pre-draft down. Now you damn to see everybody turning pre-draft down. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Back then, you weren't turning pre-draft down. No. You know what I'm well, saying? Well, because they used it to rise their stock. That's how, that's how you got – Right. You know, I think about a guy like Lindsey Hunter. If he doesn't play in the drive. To be honest with you, man, when I went there, it was my comments was through the roof. I already knew, you know, what I was going there to do. I don't think yeah. those guards knew because, again, coming out of college, my college team, we squandered our year. We, like my college team, Fresno State, we came in the year of top 10. And then before you know, we weren't even, we were unranked. We, we played in our team, we lost in the semifinals at the Garden. So they probably thought I was, that, they probably thought I wasn't that good. So mm. when I got the pre-draft, I'm talking about on the flight there. I'm like, they don't even know what's about to hit them. And when I got in there, it was, I say, it was ugly. I right. say, man, it was, I was taking them up, man. The coaches, every time you look around, the coaches looking at me like, whoo. But like I said, what played me was when they brought me in the meetings, my situation off the floor, you know. Mm-hmm. But they had no, they knew. I was talkative in there. I was directing everybody. I knew that I played a game. So they didn't have to show me none of that stuff. They had to wow. Play. You know, so. But you get to the Bucks. You get to the Bucks. I, I get drafted. I get my first three years, I got veterans in there. I'm playing for a veteran coach. Guy that just lost in the finals two years prior, uh, George Carl. Mm-hmm. I got veterans yeah. on my team. They just come miss. I mean, they just lost in the playoffs to the Pacers. And, you know, I got, I mean, I got guys, they so, they were so veteran heavy, man. I got guys that I used to watch when I was young. They was in college with J.R. Reed, Danny Manning, Denny Dell, yep. Ned Grove. I even watched, we had Haywood work. I used to watch Haywood go against the Knicks and those bleak, those, those, uh. Right, with the Pacers, even with the Pacers then. The first time you have to deal with a situation where your whole life you playing, no matter where you went, you were playing, you know, and now I'm like, they're not even looking my way. So, now I'm like, okay, well, uh, I had to, and these were these veterans were good. They always stayed in my head, like, it's like mm. Skip, your time is gonna come because they knew they just saw, stay ready. They saw me in practice, like, shit, man, your time. Even Santa said, like, nah, nah, man, stay patient, keep working, work on your game, lift weights, come here early, stay late. You know, so my three years was up. No one picked me up. Mm. I ended up actually I got waived by Golden State and training camp. So at this point now, I'm dealing really my first time of dealing with adversity and rejection in basketball. 
you know. So did your confidence ever waver? Yeah. It wavered when I right there because I'm like, damn, I'm I'm not this the first time this the first time they saying I'm not good enough. So I went back to New York City and I just chilled. I just chilled out. I was just partying, chilling out, hanging with my homeboys, mm -hmm. you know, for two months. And then God bless his soul, big escalator, one of my homeboys that I grew up with since I was a kid. They're like, yo, man, we, we, this, you can't do this no more, man. We got to go. So my agent uh, called me. He's like, man, I got some teams asking about you, but they don't know where you've been at the last two months. They want to know. I said, they want me to come to the team? they like, they want to see you play somewhere first. You got to go to the D League. So I, I ended up going down to the Mobile Revelers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, damn, I ain't even playing. But I'm like, but I'm about to kill these young kids down there. Now I just, I just <laughs> in three years in the NBA where I, mean, I wasn't getting consistent minutes. But I was in the, I was in, I was in, in, the, in the thick of things, man. And I went down there, man. I was averaging like, I want to say like 16, 17 points, six rebounds or something like that, six assists, something, something like 50, something like that. And after four or five games, it's like the Raptors, the Raptors called me up, man. And on a 10 day, I go up to the Raptors, my first three or four games, I was getting, I had like 20 points a game. <laughs> and who welcomed you to the Raptors when you got to the Raptors? Like who you was like, I'm going to take them under my wing to bring them in here to make them feel comfortable. The head coach, Lenny Wilkins, is the only one. When I got here, Lenny Wilkins is the only one that welcomed me with open arms, man. The Hall of Famer? Hall of Famer, Brooklyn, New York guy. He's the only one. The rest of them, I don't know what their issue was. Most of them were hurt because Vince, Alvin Williams, and Antonio Day, all of them were hurt, really. We, someday we were only playing with seven players. Wow. Like, in practice, yeah, we it, everybody was hurt. We can we, we, even we signed we we, we signed like another ten day dude. He'll get hurt. Somebody else will get hurt. We used to just dress eight because you got to dress eight. We dressed eight, but the eight dude wasn't playing. Damn, we was playing with seven dudes. So really, this this really kind of working in your favor in a yeah. sense because because they, they got to give they got to give you minutes. I mean, we we ended up playing against my old team, the Bucks. I, I had twenty points on them. <laughs> so, <laughs> You can spank their ass for 20? <laughs> Take this, George Carl. But but it's, it's so crazy, man. That that The 20 points didn't feel good. What felt good was after the game, all those players I was just with for three years. Just like They was like they gave me a hug. They said, boy, we knew it. We knew it. you were going to do it, man. We told you. And that's what felt oh. good is that all them guys, man, was like, boy, we knew it, man. We knew you were going to do it. And, and, you know, that's what that's what happened. So you, so you're on the Raptors. This is the turnaround because now – no. I, I leave the Raptors, I go to Miami Heat. Go to the Heat. I leave the Raptors, I go to the Heat. I play with Dwayne Wade's rookie year. We get my, my brother from my neighborhood, Lamar Odom. Uh, we got mm. Ryan Grant, Eddie Jones, Karan, uh, Karan Butler. We were picked to finish last in the NBA. We start off the season 5-15. and 15. They making fun of us, Joe. We, lo and behold, we just start crushing teams every time they came to Miami now. Wow. First year head coach, Stan Van Gundy, first time he's a head coach in the NBA. And we we, we doing our thing on them. Guys, we end up uh, getting the number four seed, and, and we end up losing the second round to the Pacers. So now I signed a six-year deal back with the Raptors. We got everything's new: new general manager, new coach, and Mitch. I'm on to a new team, team that didn't make the playoffs last year. Uh, new coach. Mm -hmm. I just I just come from a winning type culture with Pat Riley, all these guys, and I go to the culture there. I'm like, oh, this is the culture wasn't even conducive to winning. You know, man. God, it was not. Now, who, who was your head coach at that time? And Mitchell. Sam, Sam Mitchell. Mitchell. That's right. Sam Mitchell. Now, Sam, now I know Sam. Sam is old school. I don't even know what school Sam was. When <laughs> the, uh, Sam is from the old school. Like, he he rocked with the Pacers, but he was one of them. Um, what's, what's, what's my guy? He was one of them dudes that come off the bench knowing that he had to do more to stay on there. So oh, no, I know his lot. playing. I know his playing background. I'm just saying when he came to coach, I don't know what he was thinking about. I, didn't, I had no idea. Oh yeah, I, I had no idea. Did, did you think he did? Did you think he liked you? Like liked you and liked your game? I don't think he liked my game. So you signed, but you signed the one year deal with. I mean, you signed the six year deal, but you get traded yeah. after. Was it after year one? Yeah, after year one. Damn. Well, I, I demanded to get out of there. Oh, you did demand to get out of there. Oh, really? Okay. It was so much conflict there with me and the coach. Uh, me and a couple of players, it was just too much conflict, and it wasn't conducive to winning. Man. It was like the guys wasn't even working hard. Like practice started eleven, guys was walking at ten forty three, ten forty. Like it was just, it was, it was just bad. 
So when I come from a place where we were all walking at 10 o'clock for practice, like working on oh. the game, working on weights, staying in shape. So I'm sitting there like, mm. I'm sitting there like, man, I don't know what this is. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and it was just bad. It was just bad. And I was just like, man. So we, I had a couple of conflicts with a couple of players. And I told my agent, man, get me out of here. I, I wanted to bring that up about the conflict between you and Jalen Rose. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that you were saying that, hey, he's a he's a he's a heck of a guy, but a teammate. He was terrible as a teammate. And so when I got traded there, that was the one guy I looked when I looked at the roster, I thought that's the one guy I'm like, oh God, that's the guy I, we can lean on. I could always, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was only to when I realized I didn't realize it was off the floor. It was mm-hmm. the only place I could lean on the more. <laughs> Bro, on the floor is like, well, damn, bro. Like, you know, so one of the greatest guys, one of the greatest people that I've ever been around. Man. Like, I got enough respect for his game. Obviously, Fab Five, we love his game, respect to him, yeah. man. So, you know, love the fact he come from an inner city like myself. He from Detroit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so I'm, I'm just saying, on the floor, he's 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 got game. But as far as leading us, and a guy who played the finals, guy who was on the Bulls and led with the leading score one time on the Bulls as a teammate, like man, this ain't the guy that I thought I was, you know, was gonna get, you know. So we butt heads. You know what I think? I, I think he was. I mean, y'all playing the same position, right? Nah, he's not a point guard. He was a point guard in high school or college, but he's look that whole point guard thing with him was never should have never been. Really? Yeah, that it was not. I mean, because he was, I thought he was like that. You could watch him even, even now I watch his games when they play Michigan, when he played at Michigan. It, it, that was really never, that wasn't his thing. It, oh. He, he can get away with it because it's height. Because it's height, right. I thought he was on some style of like that, you know, the Penny Hardaway stuff. When he got to Denver and all that, they realized right away, no, we had to put him in, in his natural position, shooting guard a small forward. And that's what he wound up playing. There's a lot of players in this league that had to switch a position and they realized, you know what? That's where he belongs. He belongs. <laughs> Alan, Alan Iverson. Yes. Alan Iverson came with the point guard. They realized, Philadelphia realized, you know what? We move him to the two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This they, they go. Dwayne Wade, he was a, they tried him as his rookie as a point guard. By his second year, like, you know what? If we move him to the two where he don't got it, because Dwayne Wade, his rookie year, he was going to be injury prone. They move him over to the two because he's bringing it up. You ask him to go in there and score. He's got to get back on D. He's got to orchestrate the team. He's got to run the team. He's got to, you know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. so, so I got I got to ask you this. You, you're in Toronto. You ask for to be traded. They send you to Houston, but you go to Houston and you, you know, you got, you got stars there. And then even your following year, you got, you got talent come in. Steve Francis come in. These guys come in. Do you think, in retrospect, should you have stayed longer in Toronto or making the move to Houston was the best? That was great. And I'm going to a coach who I know is going to keep us in line, organize mm-hmm. us, have us well prepared. You know, that was the that was the greatest thing. That's what I wanted to be around. It's so, mm-hmm. it's so hard to, you know, because most times when you hear NBA player talk, they don't, they don't talk about the making that type of a sacrifice because in reality that was a huge sacrifice that you made because you you could have stayed there and kept getting 20 even probably on up per mm-hmm. game but yeah. to go in there and again you know Bobby Jackson comes in Steve friends I mean how how did that even how do you think that helped build your game plan with other exceptional talent like that well, it's easy for me. Now I could, you know, I just learned from playing with the Bucks where you had Cassell, Ray Allen, Glenn Robinson, Tim Tom, so much talent. We ended up day one year we lost in the Damn. conference finals. So it's just learn it was just a matter of learning how to play off those guys, man. Basketball is simple. Mm. Game is simple, man. All I had to do was play off a of T Mac, play off a of Yale, and you know, I knew I wasn't gonna have to average twenty points or seventeen. I knew just me to 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 stable I was I knew I could just go there and stabilize the team and really get us going from a defensive standpoint, making sure other guards ain't just uh, tearing us up by penetrating and, you know, and doing anything at will. So right, it was, it was simple for me over there, man. It was, it was good, man. Like, only my first year in Houston was a bad year. We all got hurt. We didn't win a lot of games, didn't make the playoffs. But 
every year after that, man, we won, we, we won an average of 52 games a year. Right. On average over there when I played this. So, Did you hold your own against the point guards you played against? Yeah, at all times. No one bust that ass, Ray. They pros and some of them are Hall of Famers. Of course they did. But it wasn't something to where they could say, man, every night I tore a skip up. You let some of them point guards, a lot of points I tell you, man, shit, that motherfucker going to D you up. He's going to twist you, turn you. Like, you're going you're gonna to use up 10 seconds with him just doing that. Eight seconds. Yep. So they knew, they knew, though. That's what's up. That is what's up. So you go from Toronto to, was it was it Orlando at this point? Or was it Vancouver? Houston to Orlando. Houston to Orlando. Mm. And then I went to the finals. We went to the finals, man. I was one of the greatest times of my life to play in the finals, man. You're a starting point guard in the finals. Man, we had a great run through the playoffs. Uh, mm-hmm. The team, I, had, I played with a great group of guys there. Just like I had in Houston, I go to another team, and these guys are similar, the personalities and they just welcome you with open arms, man. They like skip here the ball, run the team. You know what I'm saying? Dwight Howard's on the right. game, Turkle Glue, Rashad Lewis. And we had so many good role players that was on top of their game that, you know, people didn't think we had enough firepower to get to the championship. But I mean, we, we beat Cleveland in six. Dude, I was so proud of you, man. When I'm watching that game, I'm like, yeah. I hit him in his head too. <laughs> <laughs> hey Skip, you know you gotta you gotta tell that story. Now <laughs> he was cooking, he was cooking out there. But you know, he tried to make it seem like, oh, I'm bust his, I bust his ass, so that's why I hit him. Now he was cooking. Right. But Eddie is a talker. So when he made the shot, I closed, I hit the shot. I thought he said some slick while we getting up, while we're losing. So I'm like, yeah, my man, if you don't get your behind down the court, man. But I regret it because Eddie's a cool dude. It's just on the court. Yeah. He's, a, he's, he's an emotional guy on the court. He's he going to talk his trash. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. It's something I did I regret to this day. I saw the interview that you did with, you ran into Eddie House's son. Yeah, in Vegas. <laughs> yes, yes. I, went to in Vegas. I didn't know it was his son sitting next to me. <laughs> and his son's coach at the time was like, yo, man, you know who you sit next to? So I turned to the coach. I'm like, nah, man, I'm, I'm old school, man. You don't know who I am. And the coach goes, and that's the guy who slapped your dad. I said, man, stop, man. Don't tell him who you're dead. That's a video about? Oh, my like, God. Yo, I bugged out. I bugged out, man. Me and your dad is good. I was good. Oh, I would have been like, yo, kid, go sit over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. So, look, uh, there's one thing that's good about your career is that you understood the business of, 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 of trade, of, of getting traded. I mean, it's just part of it, man. I, even though even if I didn't understand it, it's just part of it, man. It's like, you know what? It is what it is, man. You know, at this point, man, I'm in my 30, 32, 33, they trade me to Orlando. I'm like, it is what it is, man. Right after we got the final, they trade me to, to New Jersey. So, wow. You know, at this point, I'm like, oh, now, okay, now this is getting stupid. You know what I'm saying? It really? We just made the finals, and you guys is trading guys. To me, I don't even think, to be till this day, I don't even think they knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah. Because it makes no sense to make that that much of wholesale changes. Like, they made all them changes, and the teams that didn't make the finals didn't even make that many changes. That's crazy. Sometimes, just because some people are general managers and some people are coach, doesn't necessarily mean they know what they're doing. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily yeah. interesting. And that's in every job. It's not just basketball. It's in every management across the spectrum of the field. Now think about this. They didn't even come close to making it sense. Yeah, you're right. Ever since that time, ever since that time, they went this way every year. Every year. And you see how many drafts has been since then? I just think about it. Here we are in 2021. Ever since the finals, they made all them changes. It went down that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Why? You didn't need to make all the changes. First of all, these are all dudes that need the basketball. And yeah. you got a guy right. in Dwight Howard and Turkle who, who mm-hmm. even though you throw them the ball, they're the most unselfish guys that you could play. Wow. Mm-hmm. wow. I got to ask you this because, you know, you played in the NBA finals against the Lakers. Did you have a relationship with Kobe? No, nah, not really. I mean, we had respect. I know. So after game one and two, Coach, I think I only played like 25, 27 minutes, some of that. So I'm normally playing 35, 36 minutes in the, in the playoffs. 
And okay. we lost games one and two. Well, game three, coach came back to me and played in like my normal 33, 35 minutes or whatever. Okay. I had 20 points. We win. Now we're down two games to one. So I'm going to game four like, oh, man, I'm about to get the minutes again. There ain't nothing Derek Fish and Jordan Farmer going to be able to do with me now. <laughs> so but after game three, I come out from doing my interview. Kobe going to do his. He like, you skip. I'm like, what's up, K? He like, I hope your coach, I hope your coach take your minutes down again. <laughs> what? I'm reading between the lines. He like, you know, we could do with you. You working us. Yeah. So he like, and lo and behold, <laughs> my, minutes, my minutes was back down to uh to what it was. And that motherfucker Kobe was smart, man. Kobe's a smart player. He could beat us from every, Damn. From every standpoint. Jesus Christ. Your NBA career, you, you you're in your thirties. At what point did you know that okay? It's getting to that time. The very next year when they sent me to uh, New Jersey. <laughs> it was just time to stop playing in the NBA. I still wanted to play some basketball. Okay. Uh -huh. like if y'all called me, if y'all called me to play in the YMCA, I ran there. You know what I mean? But it it was time. Wow. It was just time to play because it, started, it was getting a bit much. and It wasn't about ball anymore. It was about, you know, sometimes the NBA, mm. they just do favors. Yeah, you know I mean, I mean, when I was in, I remember when I was in. Uh, they traded me to go New Jersey. Guys were hurt, and then they were on their way. So we had Devin Harris was starting point guard, obviously. So they traded me, and we had like Keon Doolin and all that. And they told me they was gonna play Keon Doolin over me. I said, man, has he ever been an All Star? <laughs> right. Has he played in the finals? Like, what are you talking about? He has. I don't know. I'm just trying to see. Like, it's different if you're telling me you're gonna play a younger guy that was your number one yeah. pick. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I could dig that because I understand that y'all got to start getting that guy ready. But this is a guy that's a veteran today. He ain't that far. He's not too much younger than me. I think that's a level of the NBA that a lot of folks don't understand. That was a coach's guy. You know what I'm saying? A general mm. manager's guy. I don't know. Sometimes you could be a coach's guy or you could be a general manager's guy. It doesn't matter. It, it, I mean, right. it matters to whatever side that it has to, to say so. The benefit, yeah, right. Yeah, so... They don't, man. That's, That's crazy. Crazy. It's not about if they know what they're doing. Right now in the NFL, they're talking about, oh, man, Tim Tebow. Well, the guy that's in charge right now, Tim Tebow, is his buddy. Absolutely. It's his buddy, right. Why y'all all up mad? Like, what do you mean? Absolutely. They're going crazy in the NFL about that, but they don't. It's going, it's going, it's going on in the NBA. Yeah. Like you said, every industry. <laughs> so you, tra you transition from the league. You go to China. What, what made that decision to go play in China? Well, really, yeah, really, yeah. I remember when I played with yeah. I told him I was go over there and play, and then my agent at the time, uh, he was like, "Yo, I'm get your deal to go over there." I had fun. I was in one. I was in the third best city besides Shanghai and Beijing. Actually, see, I was in it's called Hangzhou. They were the number one city at one time before those other cities got developed. Really, but I had fun. But then I had to leave for uh, my brother's funeral, Escalade. They got to stay for the Amateur, and they they have a different culture over there. They feel if it's not your immediate relative that you shouldn't have to go to a funeral. I said in America it's different. So they put out there that, that I just wanted to quit and leave. I was like, nah, I don't know. Wow. I'm on one of the top three teams out here. We we go into the playoffs. That's more bonuses and stuff out there. I'm like, why I said I just want to go help bury him and I was coming on back. And I told him I pay my own ticket. Wow. Um, so and, and so what they said, no, nah, don't come back. They just put out a story that I didn't want to come back. I was I, I said, well then forget it. Something need no argument, need no, it doesn't need that type of energy. Right. That's crazy. So, so Rayford, man, we want we want to begin to wrap this up with you, man. We done took up so much of your time. We, man, we truly appreciate it. But what what has Rayford Austin been up to post playing days? Man, just chilling, man. Just uh, coaching, training kids. I did a couple of years of scout work for the Timberwolves. Uh, I'm just staying in basketball. That's what I'm doing. Staying yeah. in basketball and. and, and Trying to do the best I can uh, of giving the youths the, the, the wisdom and everything I've learned uh, along the way. Uh, that's not to say I don't want to become an assistant coach or head coach in the pros of college, but you know I know in due time it, it, it'll happen. So how's little? How, in your opinion, how's little Skip? Oh my son, he got a long way to go. He got he got the talent, he got the ability, but he's got a long way to go about like being mentally tough. He's got to get strong. Obviously, obviously he takes after his dad. He's skinny. But he's got to get physically strong and mentally tough. Hey, from the clips I've seen, man, he he got a swagger and a confidence about him already that 
you just wish kids had at his age. That's the clips. I got. Sh- I gotta get. I gotta show you the. Uh, I gotta start putting putting the bad clips too. <laughs> no, I don't want to see no bad clips. I don't want to see no bad clips. I want to see all good clips of Lil Skip. That's right. That's all, right. all good clips of Lil Skip. That's all I want to see. But that's how was, that's how when we was coming up. They didn't just show the good clips. <laughs> right, right. It shows you getting burnt. Shows you falling. All that. What's your place in today's game, or just in the game of basketball as a whole? I definitely can play in today's game. All 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 I'm doing is pushing the ball and, and dropping dimes, and that's all I got. And, and, and just shoot a bunch of threes. I could. I showed them that. I showed them that as my career went on, that I could hit over 100 threes in a season. So I definitely have a place in today's game. Well, one of my attributes in today's game, they don't they don't care for, and that's playing defense. So today's game, they don't care about stopping, getting stops. <laughs> it's about outscoring. Mm-hmm. Uh, my place in the game is that you know, uh, I'm guess I'll be one of them guys that uh, a lot of people will always talk about as far as uh, being a, a trendsetter, as far as. Uh, what you see now, Damn right? Guys being able to handle that ball with all with, with so much flair and passion, they can you know allow their ability to come out because you know I think it it forced coaches to conform. You know when I was coming to the game playing for coaches, they they called that junk ball or street ball. But now you see the coaches; these kids would step back 19 times on one possession. They can, they can't act as if they're the first ones to, to do all this with the basketball. Who who reminds you of yourself today? Yeah, that's hard, man. I, I could say a few of them, man, when they do it sometimes. Lonzo Ball with his ability, his IQ, his passing. Sometimes Steph Curry when he weaving around, in, weaving around, giving, giving them up fakes and all this stuff. So not, not necessarily yeah. shooting. Obviously, he's got that part over everyone. So yeah, I would say those two guys with their handles and then the ability to pass that ball. So the next chapter in your hoop dream is what? I don't know, man. Like I said, to, maybe be, to, get in the, to be a head coach in college or the pros. That would be my next chapter. Well, you heard it there first from Ray for Austin, legend. Skip to my Lou, New York City, baby. By the way, a Houston Orlando put it down. And he's right here talking with me and Willie G, man. We want to appreciate you, brother. You know, you you always been a, a good brother of ours, man. We respect you. Uh, we love you. And we want to show you your flowers now, man. But I wanted you to be the first one on our show, man, to grace us with your presence, your attitude, your education. And your philosophy on the game, man. Truly, truly, truly uh, appreciate and feel blessed now to be the first one on your show, man. You already know. Appreciate you, brother. Much love, man. We're going to catch up on that AM1, too. <laughs> All right. Yep. I'll see you, man. I'm down here in Texas right along with you. Man. All right. Tell Lil Skip I said, what's up? Yes, sir. Hello. I will. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. Know I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all for going there again. Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', trying to fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', trying to fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' Hoop Dreams the Podcast, an Unlearning Network production Written and produced by Arthur A.G., Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, and Chantel Shan with audio engineering by Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. The money get us. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me. <laughs>